This is Creative to Creative. Together, we deep dive into the creative and production processes of leading creatives, finding out what makes them tick, how they do what they do, and the challenges along the way. This is Creative to Creative, powered by Motion by Design. This week, we interview Carla Grace, a full-time wildlife artist specialising in realistic oils and acrylic paintings from our hometown in South Australia. I've got a, I've got a question around your subject matter. So yeah. not only um, finding the source of your inspiration might be a little bit difficult, but also like whether you're sourcing photographs, mm. for instance, yeah. for your your for your compositions. Like, how do you choose? What animal? How do you choose your composition? Where are you getting your inspiration from for your paintings? This is a huge topic among artists because there's like this overarching um, sense of entitlement when it comes to reference material. So I initially would search online for an image that like just sparked a creative um, motivation, I guess, and that is probably how the majority of wildlife artists work is they look for great reference material and turn that into a painting. So that's how I started off. And the only problem with that is you're turning an already great image into a painting. So like the difference obviously is that one's a painting, one's a photograph, but something that is already a great photograph, I've come to learn to allow it to stay as a photograph because that's already an artwork. So learn like understanding that I was limiting myself to what I could only see in one image. I started to train myself to expand beyond an image. So to start creating an animal in my head based on a concept that I then like created in my mind that I couldn't necessarily find in one image based on lighting and form. Like it came from years of trying to understand and create that technical strength to be able to do that. So then I would go out and take my own reference material and bring it back into the studio. I could just imagine you and your family like going <laughs> as like lions in the background <laughs> for reference material. <laughs> oh my gosh, I actually used my husband to like create the form that I was trying to create of a chimp. <laughs> just hold it like that. No, I'm not going to do that, Carla. So um, I have used people to try because changing the lighting I think is the hardest part when it's not in the reference photo but you want it in the painting because mm. that changes the way the form is of the animal. So mm. there were a lot of – so this started in 2019 – where I started to, like I created the portrait of a chimp from five different images of a chimp. Mm -hmm. So the arm came from one, the face, the mouth, the shoulders, the posture, the lighting, the colour. You Frankenstein a chimp. I Frankenstein a chimp. And my husband was the frame to stitch it all together. <laughs> he was made to stand awkwardly. Um, and that, like being able to successfully create a Frankenstein chimp that when it was created as a painting, it looked believable. Like you looked at it and you thought that this was created from one image. Being able to do that and see the end result, even though it took far too long to do, it began a process in my mind where I started to see the potential of wildlife art that could not be a photograph. Because that's the biggest critique I hear of wildlife art is oh, why not just take a photograph mm. because it's the same thing. Especially if it's realism. Yeah. Exactly with yeah. realism. Yes. Yeah. So because there's no, like I struggle with an abstraction of reality. I just don't have that creative flair in my brain. So you wouldn't paint like a chimp in space. It's not something. I can't. Yeah. I just can't see it. Like I just, I can like imagine it. But when it comes to the actual physical painting, I just can't see those details and like I need some point of reference to work with. So now if I don't have the reference photo myself from material that I've taken like at a zoo or on safari or whatever, I will look online for specific elements that I'm looking for. So if I want to, if I'm painting a lion, for example, I'll already have the design of it in my mind and then I go online and I look for the expression, usually will be the first thing I look for. Mm -hmm the way the paws sit, the way the shoulders, the chest, the muscles, the light shining over. I'll try and find something that has the overall light effect 
because big cats are really hard to sort of imitate in the studio unless I buy a massive stuffed toy and like stick a metal frame in it and like change it to it just doesn't quite work so there are certain limits and that's why I think a lot of my work up to this point has been quite dark because when you can merge things into shadow it's very forgiving but I now have a new challenge that I've set myself to use lots of color Mm -hmm. because I have very little color theory experience so I'm now starting to incorporate more color, more light. And this is very unforgiving when it comes to trying to Frankenstein a creature. So my reference material is now put together on um, Procreate. Mm-hmm. And if I can't get it to work on Procreate, then I won't be able to get it to work on the canvas because I can't create the reference to work from. Yeah. Yeah. So the overall creative process is both creative, I guess, at the end of the day because it's coming from my imagination versus trying to source it externally, which is how I was at the start. And so, I'm yeah. so you're photoshopping a bunch of images together yes. to make your own composition when then yes. you're painting off that. Yes. <laughs> oh. In a roundabout way. <laughs> So how do you pick your subject matter? Like a chimp mm. paintings worth more money than line paintings? And is that a decision that you make in terms of your strategy? Uh, it's sort of, it used to be. So I used to choose things that I saw other artists doing successfully and think, oh, that's what people want to buy. So that used to drive how I would choose what my next painting was going to be. I stopped doing that as soon as I figured out it was burning me out because I'm choosing subject matter based on another person's inspiration rather than my own. So what's worth more, a chimp or a lion? Neither. Neither. It's the, it's the brand that makes the artwork at the <laughs> end of the day. <laughs> right. So they're yeah. the same price or is it, is it harder to paint a chimp because of the hair or, a, you know, a lion? I wouldn't say so the value of the painting will come down to the level of detail. I guess, the size of the artwork and very rarely the time that I put into it at the moment because if if a piece is more experimental, it will take longer. Um, But it's not specifically like a lion is more valuable versus a chimp or a rhino or a bunny. So you're not thinking of the greater greater audience when you're thinking no. of not at all. No, it's just like what I want to do is the way it that has, I want to do it. It has to come from me, mm-hmm. and like you can you can be so it can be such a subtle thing, but having the longevity to get to the end of the artwork to see it from initial to completion, mm. it has to come from from me because it's such a big process that is so involved. It yeah, if it's based on another person's inspiration like you get halfway through and you think oh this is shit yeah absolutely <laughs> like, it's just not yeah it's not something that can sustain itself so how long does a painting take so depending on what the painting is it can take between a month and three and a half months i think there's there's the unspoken element of my children in the background there that soak up a lot of time Uh, And also doing the tutorial side as well as the original artwork side, my time is shared between both platforms and it's obviously really hard to make significant progress on either of them. It's just a slow trudge on both sides Mm -hmm. to try and make it to the finish line. So I've had a painting on the easel, which was meant to be a study for a larger piece, which is going to be a more complex conceptual piece for almost a month but I've only been able to spend eight days on it in that month. So that's why basing value of an artwork on the time (laughs) that it's been in front of me is really hard because it's the time is just sort of something that I can't control at the moment. So how do you value your work? Obviously Mm -hmm. you've mentioned a few things around the, the platform or the media is worth Yep. some sort of money or mm-hmm. a, a range of money and then yeah. you might be throwing in some, you know, this one took me a year to make versus a day. Like how yeah. do you value your own work? That's come through a really long time of experience and being able to charge and what people are willing to pay. So at the end of the day, people are not going to 
pay money for something they don't see the value in. So creating the value through every level like I was talking about before and in the artwork itself. So I started off like with my commissions when I was in high school with a little formula. I'm happy to share it. It was um, the size of the painting in inches squared multiplied by the level of detail plus tax and shipping and materials. So for example, if a painting was a four by six, it would be 24 times, let's say, I thought I maybe it would be a three day painting. So I'd multiply it by maybe six or something and then add the tax and <laughs> materials and things like that. So people were getting a consistent breakdown of their expenses mm. And it became very obvious very soon what people were willing to pay uh, and what I felt my time was worth in the end. 